thanks everyone for joining to speak about uh, kernel migration from 2.6 to 5.10 and the story about it. And probably you might be already having the provoking wondering question, why on earth somebody has to do such a huge migration from 2.6 to 5.10 on earth. So that is what the question to answer as part of this presentation. So uh, quick a bit about myself. So Parthip and myself working for Linux and we primarily work on embedded Linux and uh, Zephyr in terms of supporting both supported packages, drivers and uh, various low level stuffs in there and uh, we deliver solutions and build solutions like Yocto projects and so. So uh, as part of this today's uh, discussion, so the agenda itself is basically split into three different parts. The first thing is um, just to say why we really needed such migration in uh, requirement from the customer perspective. And the second part explains about how we actually did it. And then the last part um, explains about like what are the key factors you consider for your product if it is really applicable for your product. So wherein the how part like how do we actually did is uh, not explaining every inch and every pieces of uh, migration uh, issues and what are the drivers which we try to migrate and the whole thing. So I just gave a brief about kernel and as well as the bootloader perspective like that is the idea here. So, um, so I did assume few things like say um, when we try to migrate this uh, hardware SOCs from companies, uh, customer companies. So the uh, IP blocks were not complete. So we had to add uh, drivers in uh, like pin control changes in GPIO and other stuff as well. But those part of it is not covered in this presentation. We just assume, I just assume at least the IP blocks are completely sup supported in U-boot and as well as uh, the Linux kernel. So I'm, we are not going to add a new driver or migrate a driver from uh, specific things. So the code changes are super minimalistic and then like we are not going to discuss about some external kernel drivers kept for the customized, um, let us say vendors like automotive um, specifically we speak about that. So and then like the knowledge about device tree is assumed please do. So uh, we cannot, we are not going to explain about what is going to device tree and how we are going to handle that and things like that. So uh, why migration? So this is the first place in things which comes in place like say uh, customers are really excited about let us say the in, in terms of telematics domain, in terms of automotive domain uh, specifically what uh, resulted in this migration. So we are really excited about artificial intelligence, machine learning and all these new technologies and then they are excited about the new hardware which is actually capable of doing such things like uh, IMX8, uh, NVIDIA Jetson and so on. But then like when it uh, really turns out, uh, what it really turns out is like when we look for making such hardwares. Uh, in reality in the PCB. So one way or another you end up, end up doing getting this uh, result from your supplier, vendor whatsoever. So this particular screenshot is directly take up, taken from Mauser. I am not like editing that particular picture, it is directly taken. So 2059, so uh, specifically I, I assume myself like this particular uh, IC is like probably they are taking the silicon from Mars or another planet and trying to produce it or so. Yeah. so so <laughs> this particular part like say what results in the chip shortage, um, let me just quickly check how to move this presentation, okay anyways that is fine. So uh, chip shortage is like um, in terms of automotive domain like they get the SOC from a specific vendor SOM or a group of components from a specific component uh, like vendor and then like uh, for example Qualcomm or provider of its Qualcomm uh, SOMs. So those are not completely available like meaning uh, when you try to plan for new uh, hardware platforms in the upcoming days like in upcoming years. So they are, at least for automotive domain they have been planning for like 5-10 years advance and then like uh, producing the same hardware for maybe 15 years or so. So such availability was uh, difficult and then like that is why they did it and then also there is like obsolescence of like uh, various SOCs specifically um, IMX6 going to be and then like so let us say uh, NAND and NOR other chipsets and so on like those things were the one resulting in chip shortage. Um, and like for example, if we assume a specific SOC even though um, let us say um, migration I meant say from one platform to another, uh, one generation to another. So you use the same SOC but then like you cannot use other components as part of the hardware. So because those are either obsolete or not available then like you need to create a new hardware platform based on it. So that is about the issues. So to come to a common ground again the same question lives like say why we need a migration of this kind uh, or is this really valid for your pro product portfolio in specifically. So that is what the question we are going to answer 
and then like there is another question like say how long it will take. So, assuming this is uh, let us say it is okay I wanted to do it, but then how long it will take in reality. So, that is the later part of the presentation where we speak like what are the caveats and what are the problems which we faced and so on. So, this is just a quick example in terms of the product life cycle which is planned uh, for a telematics unit uh, from our customer. So, they have a, a generation generation 3 which is currently being produced and it is okay and it is currently available and it is planned for at least like 20 to 50, 25 or something. And then like there is another next gen, uh, generation let us say generation 4 which is uh, going to be available let us say the production plan is from 2025 or so. So, that is like not an overlap, but still they are trying to match up with the production lineup for the real telematics units or real uh, infotainment unit in this case. So, the development timeline uh, wherein uh, before the production like let us say we have 5 years or 8 years of development timeline with various vendors involved in terms of software and as well as hardware. So, that is the actual plan, on, uh, plan in the product life cycle, but then what exactly happened by 2018 and then 2022 by this timeline is basically because of the chip shortage and the availability of the hardware they could not produce it, the development time just elapsed, elapsed, elapsed and then like they tried to change things and then but still they could not produce the real hardware. Meaning, the software for the generation 4 is completely ready, meaning you have the base platform is latest and everything is perfect and they migrated the whole middleware and application side of it and everything is good in terms of telematics, let us say um, every modem firmware and all these things are perfectly ready, but then it is not ready for the market. So, it could not be produced. So, that is one case and another case is like there is an X or Y customer which is already doing the generation 3, but they wanted to do uh, an additional or uh, a different um, like excitement like let us say the, S, the excitements which we spoke, uh, they wanted to do ADAS or specific use cases wherein they wanted to do, do the new hardware, but then it is not available and then like they wanted to go something intermediate which is capable of doing the software capability as in generation 4, but then like not uh, with not like as in the hardware is not available like they, they, they just need another, another intermediate things. So, that is when the new customers comes in place for their uh, telematics systems when then like they wanted to migrate to something new in terms of software, maybe retaining the same hardware in there. So, um, what are the customer use cases primarily considered in there in, the, in this particular scenario. So, retain the middleware and application software which is actually developed for the generation 4 and then it can be directly used for the generation 3 hardware and then create an evolution hardware like intermediate hardware called generation 3 plus. So, that was the prime thing and then like retaining the software. So, um, we probably already know that like the connectivity mechanism uh, connectivity technology 3G is obsolete and then like couple of company couple of countries and the unions already close their network in terms of 3G. So, the platform which is based on gen 3 is like generation 3 which I mentioned is uh, based out of the modem from Qualcomm which is primarily working on gen 3, but when uh, like uh, based on 3G. So, it, assuming 3G is closed and then it fall back to 3G. So, which is not nice in terms of going into the telematics emergency SOS system which needs to work faster. So, that is when they wanted to migrate to something super latest which is 5G whereas in the chipset is not available, but then like uh, they wanted to have something intermediate with the same uh, generation of hardware. So, in scenarios like this they migrated from uh, to 3G technology to 4G in terms of LTE from the modem provider like Qualcomm and then you retaining the same middleware and software. So, the one other major point of market here is like what is the cost involved in producing this and the timeline which is involved in producing this. So, when we go for generation 4, the hardware is not available, you cannot produce it. When you go for generation 3, which is super, super old, let us say the hardware is okay, but then the software side we cannot run gen, generation 4 related things. So, that is where the intermediate platform comes in place and then like we create a platform called generation 3 plus that is a completely decision from I mean not us meaning the customer decision. So, to create an intermediate platform and go with it. So, that the development timeline is super short in a way to bring everything from generation 4 into gen 3 plus. So, and then like we have every software based on generation 4 running on gen 3 and then which will create a uh, new platform to explore their market and keep the market until the next generation comes in place really like when the hardware is really available. So, now, now that we spoke about okay the real scenarios which we faced in our customers cases uh, why we really do the migrate then like how we really do wherein the like what components we really need to consider in this case. So, um, as I said before the middleware and all the application aspects of uh, let us say the spe specific use case about telematics or infotainment systems they were being kept directly developed or inherited or retained directly from the generation 4 platform, uh, but then 
the other pieces which is of the core components which is Linux kernel, U-boot and other base systems has to be considered. So that is the core component which we are going to speak about not extensively in all the set all set of it but then with base about kernel and so on. So in terms of um, bringing to new hardware that is like the generation 3 plus. So that there are uh, cases like uh, the network ICs has been changed from generation uh, 3 and then it is not available they will have to change something new and then bring to as I said before the 4G network instead of 3G network. So then we have to change certain pieces and software which helped in us to uh, explore new possibilities in terms of over the air software update and things like that. So uh, in terms of uh, how we uh, can migrate from let us say the uh, keep the same gen 3 hardware platform and run the gen 4 software like using Linux 5.10 using latest U boot and so on. So I feel like okay adding a new hardware platform to your Linux kernel or U boot is exactly uh, we are going to do the exact uh, thing like even though the IP block support is completely available we do not want it to break the whole system in there. So that is why I recommended and then like started with like adding the basic blocks like UART the or before before coming into the UART like we have to bring in the clock driver, trimer driver even though the IP blocks are available, bring the device tree working functional and then you add all the peripherals into it. So add stepwise or one step at a time in there. So and then like <coughs> adding the features wise like less, uh, when, when we migrate from 2.6 to 5.10 there are like n x number of things which are needed or x number of things which is not needed as part of the kconfig, defconfig features of the Linux kernel. So that is what we are going to discuss a little detail in here. So <coughs> what is uh, uh, when, when it comes to kernel like what really changed uh, or widely changed from 2.6 to 5.10. The first point uh, which comes to uh, uh, thing is like we migrated the whole thing from machine code, uh, the implementation of the whole board definition and as well as uh, the driver definition how the platform devices has been created. So the whole thing is migrated from uh, the machine code into the device tree. So that is when um, how the hardware platform has been identified and what has been changed that is the first point which I wanted to say about in, a, in, in the next slide or so and then like um, we created the device tree and the purpose of the device tree and how we purposed this particular uh, device tree for the new hardware platforms. Let us say we have uh, for example board A, B, C and then like A, B, C will carry over different display systems like X, Y and Z. So when you combine these two uh, there will be X number of combinations. Uh, combining the hardware platform and together with the display systems. So that is when uh, you wanted to create multiple device trees and then how do you want to use it really in the systems. So we also had uh, scenarios like memory configuration which is like say we have a custom, custom driver which takes uh, a reserved amount of memory and then previously we have been dealing this like specifically with allocating the memory in the kernel uh, passing the kernel in 2.6 and then how do you do this in right now with 5.10. So we do the uh, things with device tree that is what we are going to see in a moment. So the whole uh, idea about migrating the kernel from 2.6 to 5.10 in this scenario is basically super less changes in the curd code because we removed most part of the implementation in the machine definition and then moved into the device tree approach. So there is no large set of code changes very less amount in terms of like say adding the new IP blocks or the customized IP blocks which is not available in the mainline kernel or something like that. So that is the main thing of advantages which we faced and then like um, migrating the disk config which we will see step wise. So as, as the first thing like say the first important thing I would say like moving the kernel uh, from the machine code part to the device tree part. So the 2.6 implementation of the whole uh, hardware like let us say the IMX platform or uh, the NVIDIA platform or I mean NVIDIA is not support but like the assuming this current example support NVIDIA uh, or uh, let us say Qualcomm examples where it was currently it was based on 2.6 and then the whole board categories like say um, they produce like 10 or 15 variants of the same hardware for different vendors of the automotive domain. So the whole definition was into the part of machine code and then we had to migrate them completely into the device tree part. So how what exactly uh, or what really changed in this particular aspect. So the machine start part or defining the whole machine side of it is completely moved into the device tree. So this slide just depicts like what um, how do we actually do like the machine type actually comes from um, the bootloader and then the kernel takes care of it by reading this machine type and then we were using the machine definition directly from the architectural part of the code in 2.6 but then with um, latest 510 
the whole thing is passed via device tree blob loaded by the u boot and then it will be functional or passed and created or consumed by the kernel. So, that is just the depiction of this particular picture, but then the whole definition ok. So, the example which we here so shown is basically uh, based out of the Atmel platform. So, because I, I cannot show a platform which is used or the code which is really customized and used by the automotive domain due to the proprietary reasons. So, the one which is here which we migrated for another platform for an IOT device is taken from the different hardware. So, from 2.6 we have this machine definitions directly. So, uh, you have machine start and machine start uh, end which is carry over the unit function of the whole platform SOC and then peripheral blocks and then initialization of the olden age. So, the 2.6 way of doing it at least 3.0 until 3.1 or something like that. So, this whole part of implementation which kept for years in this particular domain on telematics has to be completely removed because we had to completely move to a different approach called device tree. So, we already know this part. So, we just need to create device tree for every uh, specific hardware and then like it can be overlaid if there is a difference on top of it and so on. So, that is one prime difference we just create device tree and then like as many number of device tree uh, nodes or as, as many number of device tree files like based on the number of boards which we have. That is the first change which we had I think I skipped it yeah. So, and then this uh, there were custom uh, peripheral connections like I am not speaking about uh, the serial interfaces which is uh, going to give you a console or which is going to be used for uh, specific purposes which is defaulted, but I am not speaking about it. So, in this case um, there were cases where the uh, there is an MCU which is on the board which is doing another operation probably communicate with the modem in terms of telematic systems. So, which will be connected over UART, but then the whole definition of this implementation let us say the UART communication and how you communicate and what you do with the user space application and the middleware. So, the whole purpose of the whole usage of 2.3 I mean 2.6 kernel in the generation 3 is basically implemented in the machine definition. So, we had to again scrap the whole thing and uh, remove every part of the code and come back to the device tree approach in terms of migrating from 2.6 to 5.10. So, in this here like as you can I mean most people can already recognize the device tree part here. So, we been just using um, the whole like let us say there are x number of uh, files implemented in the machine code and then like uh, using the customized driver in our external driver as well as in the mainline uh, 2.6 and so on. So, the whole patching is completely dead and then completely removed and then just there is only one adaptation which is done just creating the device tree node for the UART that made the life easier in terms of migrating the whole UART driver even though it is a custom implementation for a custom hardware. And this is just another example about like say how do you add your device tree. So, once you create the device tree for x number of hardware platforms let us say from board A to board C and then like you create x number of device tree overlays for your uh, device tree overlays or device tree include files for your display systems uh, for infotainment systems or telematic systems. So, those can be added just like you just go in adding into the make file system of the uh, kernel and then like you just have the device tree file in there. So, once you do this you enable this particular kconfig platform for uh, this particular SOC then the compile system completes this. So, the example shown here is basically on the 8091 platform from Atmel, but then the real scenario is basically we did this for like say IMX platform or telematics platform which is based on Qualcomm SOC or so. So, yeah. So, there are other pieces which also need needed migration for example, um, in 2.2.6 or 2.6 end or 3.0. So, most uh, I square C operations like say I we have laid out the, the actual PCB was laid out with uh, set of sensors and also it uh, laid out with set of audio codecs like, which, expo which exposes the configuration over I square C and then the actual audio is exposed over I square S. So, those pieces of hardware were maintained I mean the software part of this whole um, customized or codecs and things were, were not in the main line in 2.6. So, it were completely maintained as an external driver which is like maybe an out of tree com custom driver or even though it is in tree in 2.6 it is all custom actually it is implemented only for this particular purpose. When migrating from this um, part there are also drivers which is in the user space which does the um, IOCTAL call to set the device uh, address on the I square C and communicate over read write uh, systems. So, and then the whole implementation is in also user space or not just in the out of C kernel driver, but also in the user space. So, migrating from that perspective to uh, 510 um, helped us in a way that like we can use features from 5.10 uh, something like industry IO subsystem and so on. So, that is just a quick 
EC migration in terms of adding new sensors uh, using the IAO subsystem exposing SysFS based interfaces and also like in terms of audio as well. So the last part of the kernel where we, uh, we need keen time or more time uh, is about the def config migration. So when then like we are in like 2.6 kernel had x number of features let us say we had a large set of K, uh, def config enabled but then those def config were not completely relevant anymore in Python. So we had to review each and every point or every single step and then migrate the whole def config from 2.6 to 5.10. dot ten. So meaning uh, we had to do a fresh creation but then we have not created with like um, all no def config or all s con def config either. So we started with something intermediate with basic board and SOC support and then we had to add features gradually. So the major point about is like uh, maintaining the same platform let us say the same SOC or SOM platform uh, the memory layout of this particular storage medium is uh, let us say we have 5 or 6 partition and the kernel is allocated with 4 megabyte or so we cannot explode this one because we wanted to retain the same thing with the new new generation 3 plus as well. So in this particular scenario we face like limitations in terms of size so we had to uh, compromise between compression and as well as disabling features in a way that like uh, we have to do we have to keep the loading time super fast the booting time super fast so that the telematic system starts immediately or quickly. So such scenario of things were like a compromise or trade off which we discussed or uh, and then like we had played around with the diff config like say we have we can enable this uh, compression with squasfs with lzo or so or even we may not be able to enable compression and so. So those were the things which we were been dealing with in terms of diff config migration from 2.6 to 5 just because there is like my like impact in terms of size change in terms of feature changes and so on. That is about the kernel part even though uh, we did the migration of the U boot bootloader from 2009 to 2020 version and we are not going to discuss about the whole part about how we did it even though we did something like say the 2009 version does not have any device tree support from the U, uh, U boot perspective we did the U boot perspective of device tree adding the new uh, board definition or moving the mode definition board definition and also the pu custom power sequences in terms of telematic systems and so on. So suspend to RAM and all this background so everything is implemented but then uh, we, we migrated in a way but then we are not going to discuss all the points about U boot in this case. So what we are going to discuss now is about like so on behalf of the Linux kernel changes let us say um, we moved from 2.6 to 5.10 so what exactly the file, si file sizes and file format is and then like how compression changed it and how uh, we actually moved from the device tree world how to move to the device tree world from the machine code definition. So this particular snippet explains like say the basics about we had as I said before three different hardware, three different uh, displays will create an X number of combination. So then like in this particular X number of combination how do you select a specific device tree in terms of load time or from the bootloader perspective. So we had an uh, board identification mechanism which is based out of let us say a register sets or a GPIO sequence uh, in, in, in a hardware uh, which is under telematics. We use the same mechanism but then based on the same mechanism we select a specific device tree or even apply an overlay on top of it. So we make, make use of fit image at this point of time previously it was like Z image concept. So that is what the next thing which I am going to speak about. So apart from the board definition identification and then loading part there are a couple of things which we also had to consider in this scenario because the kernel has been migrated. So one thing is we do not have uh, we did not have fit image by the time in 2009 so 2010 based hardware but then like we had to move to boot Z to boot M and boot the fit image support and add up all the DTB blocks together into let us say single fit image and then load them in uh, like use, use, the, use, a, use a mechanism something like this to load a device tree in there. So and then like loading uh, the kernel itself from a different storage medium or different mechanism because we have been using JFFS2 and a different file system approach but then it is changed because we migrated to the latest one like either we use squasfs, ubfs or uh, better mechanisms in the latest kernel in, in even using the NAND. So there is a change in storage uh, file system approach so we had to change uh, based on which let us say we had a boot SCR based loading in, in 2009 but then like we moved to read only based uh, approach so that it cannot be corrupted in security perspective and so on like that is another thing which is uh, loading the based on the file system approach. Okay, So that is mostly it like I am not 
as I said before, I have not discussed like extensively in terms of uh, what is the migration perspective in kernel. Let us say uh, we can speak about IP blocks, how do you migrate and a specific driver, how do you migrate and then like so on like what are all the things which we faced. But then like in a big picture what we did is specifically changing in the kernel perspective and then what the impacts uh, that like say we, we changed x number of things in kernel migration and what is impacted in the kernel perspective uh, u boot perspective. So, uh, these things were being like discussed and then like we, we did this migration for this uh, let us say the kernel migration and then the impacted part in the u boot side. Now that we saw about okay, so what are the things which we did. So, now if you feel this particular product you have a product something similar and then you have a solar problems uh, statement something similar in terms of migrating or you needed migration just because of the hardware is not available or you may have an except um, let us say the development time even though if you have a hardware production is available, but then like you have a development timeline uh, issues and then like you keep the existing customer with the hardware. So, if you consider this particular migration for your perspective, so what should we consider? So, probably these are the key factors in terms of unexpected deviations and things like this which we faced in reality. So, let us go in detail about how uh, much amount of software deviation which we consider, but like let us say you, you have a hardware deviation because of uh, chip, uh, chip unavailability, but then you addressed it with another platform intermediate platform like Gen 3 plus. So, how do you address this uh, software time deviation what exactly it is? Let us discuss that in a moment and then like there are things where in like the hardware itself change as I said like Gen 3 is okay, but then like Gen 3 plus when you try to create you cannot create the same uh, exact platform because uh, let us say the Micron is not no more having the same NAND flash for your Gen 3 plus. So, you had to use a different uh, NAND flash which is pin to pin compatible everything exactly same except for the fact there are changes in the hardware itself. So, how do you address and what do you face in terms of time deviation and caveats with this particular cases. So, uh, there are things like say the couple of where couple of cases where as I said before the kernel partition itself let us say 4 megabytes and we do not want to change it because the customer sticks with the exact uh, partition layout of this whole system let us say u boot uh, kernel and then root file system and then the basic layout they do not they do not want to change it. But then when we migrate to the kernel 510 we have a large set of size which needs compression which needs uh, stripping down the whole thing. So, the main thing which we did is like move most part of the kernel configuration into a module. So, the base kernel lives and the base SOC lives and then the base initialization lives. So, all the rest goes to the kernel module and then when we have what technically we faced is like at some point we have we had to do uh, compromise in such a way that like we have to in disable or uh, the file system itself has to go into a module. So, this resulted in let us say um, kernel cannot directly load the root file system because it does not have the kernel built in support for the file system because we had to disable because of the size and so on and loading time as well. So, then we introduced another concept called init RAMFS, but it was init Audi uh, RAM disk and then like RAMFS file system now and then like with RAMFS we have enabled many other features together with loading the file system from the init RAMFS and then loading the kernel system sorry root file system. So, that is when it is like we had to change things in root uh, RAMFS and RAM0 because okay. So, when it comes to systems like telematics changing certain things of boot argument or um, read only partitions of this form as enormous amount of impact in terms of production timelines as well. So, that is when like boot arcs and things were changed to adapt and probably you have to consider in such a way like if you have a um, strict partition layout which we cannot change in uh, scenarios like this. So, so that is this is another uh, caveat or an exception um, unexpected deviation which we faced as well wherein like say we get we get the SOM from a vendor from uh, Qualcomm or supplier of Qualcomm and then like they when we do a migration from our existing platform and a new 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 platform for an example as I said before 3G to 4G as an intermediate solution wherein we have uh, a set of partitions which is newly introduced by the vendor by itself which is cannot which cannot be changed because that is not used by the Linux side of the system, but then actually modem side of the system. They have the dedicated memory and then the actual side of the system. So, such scenarios resulted in, in a changes in R and as well. Let us say um, partition layout changes actually changes back to the uh, boot, boot system of the U boot configuration and then back into how do you read the uh, NAND and where from where exactly you read the NAND from. So, that changed it. So, the other point which I mentioned is about change of the NAND chip itself like when Micron does not uh, have enough supply for or, or they 
uh, stop production for that particular IC for that matter when we change one NAND IC to another even though if it is pin compatible. So, this where like the board itself is produced and that we have the board and we have functional system with the same layout and things like that. But then when it comes to the NAND um, the initial one the, the existing one was based about uh, the 2 cage page size and then the new one was based out of 4k page size. So, this uh, is resulting in what? So, let us say um, in the first case scenario it is like an existing platform gen 3. So, where we have um, 2k page size where the first stage bootloader is basically allocated with the 10 kilobytes of size in the uh, memory layout and then uh, which is basically 5 pages altogether 2 into 5. So, in there in the later scenario this actually overlaps or needs um, corrupts the other part of the memory. So, this is like we have to strip down back to uh, ten, just 2 kilo the, this extra overlap in terms of this other uh, the other memory layout has to be stripped down because we, we have 4k pages which, which results in 3 pages in there. So, those part resulted in the image stripping part or the partition size adjustment in there. So, not the partition layout change, but just the partition size adjustments in there. So, apart from these things like we had also as I said before uh, we, we, we had also drivers which is uh, custom built for this particular customer cases where it used for error logging uh, telematic systems. So, when the system abruptly resets or scenarios wherein the system needs to have keep the error logging system and then send back to back server back end server and figure out what really happened in scenarios like this. So, this memory reservation has been completely done in the Linux kernel in terms of not initializing this particular set of memory and then a whole patching and things like this. So, this is changed completely to a new thing like say previously we have been creating the platform device manually in terms of kernel, but then this is migrated back to a newer approach which is device tree and then with device tree we have a flexibility to use reserved memory. When we do reserved memory approach we have memory reservation automatically done by the kernel and then like we just need to consume this particular thing. So, the device is automatically created for the user space to function with it. So, there are also things which we move from uh, ABI custom uh, compatibility and then ABI compatibility those part has also been changed. So, one last thing about uh, before uh, closing this uh, migration part. So, we deliver solutions as part of the Octo system. So, that is what uh, the whole thing is covered underlying with the Octo system and then we deliver a solution in Octo. So, that is like just a layout about how the SOC uh, or the architecture until the board things laid out say and then like in, in terms of this uh, we have a board on top of it and then like how exactly it laid out it based out of an SOC and then which is based out of an SOC series and then like SOC family and then which is based out of a specific architecture. So, how exactly this laid out in Yocto build system. So, when it comes to Yocto latest a Kirkstone or the latest version of it we already had I mean not just the support for any latest SOCs like A72, A78 or something like that but also we also have support for the older uh, architecture until V4 as well. So, this helped us or quickly mig uh, help us in migration from let us say um, the <coughs> older build system which is like not really build root, but it is a customized build root they had, but we migrated from that perspective to the latest Yocto version here. So, as you can already see in this particular picture, so the first we had the SOC series and then the specific SOC and then which points out back to the uh, <coughs> architecture specific let us say uh, ARM v5 until. So, the whole definition is customized like easy or in terms of porting the whole thing in the, uh, when we come to Yocto in, in scenarios like you can cross compare the whole thing with from the board until the architecture perspective here. I jumped in there ok. So, with that uh, what uh, other benefits which we also get apart from the whole migration part is like we had uh, features like uh, specifically on a telecommunication system where we, we had a features like uh, distributed switch architecture which we can uh, employ with to achieve the use cases instead of writing the whole network switch driver in a user space side. So, we enabled and used out the uh, distributed switch architecture and then like um, we also had basic support in terms of uh, the power management when it comes to 2.6 and then like we had an enormous extensive support in terms of uh, PM runtime, uh, system runtime and so on like those helped us in saving uh, a lot of amount of power when it comes to the telematic system it needs to run even though the car is not really running in scenarios. So, those helped us in terms of uh, reducing the power optimization in there. So, we also had uh, virtualization support which we trying currently trying to consume in a way to 
establish, establish and enable run embedded containers which meaning x number of containers can even run in a low memory footprint and so on. So, that is uh, also one another enablement and also like in terms of uh, over the air software update and things where we had uh, capability to do partition layout changes and which helped us in terms of enabling over the air software update using RAUG and then uh, SW update together with the Hawkbit systems and so on. So, that is another aspect and there are also other aspects which we need to say like say we, we were using config fs when we are trying to connect an iPod into an infotainment, infotainment systems and then enumerating and functioning with the USB system. So, in with here we migrated using config fs because uh, with latest kernel we have this feature and then like using a user space respective libraries like lib USB G or so. So, that is where changes like um, which or helped us adding more positive features in here apart from that. So, we also had squasfs, read only file system, compression and enabling various other security possibilities with fit image and so on. So, that is mostly uh, uh, it from my end. So, as you can see like this is just the basic uh, uh, overview about how we did the migration for the whole thing from 2.6 to 5.10 for a couple of use cases or I would say 3, 4 use cases which was based on like the older hardware. So, you can uh, read about the device tree part and as well as the board porting which was another talk from Bootland and the other different conference actually. So, with that thank you so much, uh, I am open for questions if any maybe we have a couple of minutes, yeah sure. Uh, how long did it take? Well, the development time uh, it takes like couple of months I would say, it initial porting was successful uh, running of 3 months timeline, but for the real production and testing for the end customer because it is automotive it take another like 3 to 4 months of testing and coming back to the production line actually. But like considering other use cases like IoT domain, which is uh, let us say basic simply simple network en enablement from 2.6 to 5.10 that is ok, because IoT does not exist at that time, but like we speak a different terminology like wireless sensor networks and then uh, from like 2010 or 2011 side of it, yeah. Superb. Thank you so much.